So Qumran, the health of this society around the Dead Sea. Qumran est un sanitaire vie et mort de la société autour de la mer morte. This has been a collaborative study between the Irish and the French. And I'm going to do a brief introduction in Irish, French, and English. So please don't run out of the room with your head in your hands. It'll be over very soon. And then it gets very interesting. So dia gwit, tron on in va agus folja. Is complisk sandaliakta biog a stock agus beder na vrangaha e komrani vasak yudok. Sira huig de virvarov ata suite er emal ald klor marli snitje e gamwadi komran. Daimshig bedwin scrolli na mara marov e neged daha de shocked. I bluus na halahus. Bonjour, bonsoir e bienvenu. Komen don le desert de Jude au nord ouest de la mer morte e un petit complex archeologique particulier et peut être inclassable au beau d'un plateau mardo, crucé par le Wadi Qumran. Les manuscrits de la mer mort ont été découverts en 1947 par des Bédouins dans la côte de la falaise qui le domine. Good evening and welcome. Qumran in the Judean desert northwest of the Dead Sea is a small, peculiar, and perhaps unclassifiable archaeological complex located on the edge of a Marley plateau carved by the Wadi Qumran. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947 by the Bedouins in the caves of the cliff above. So, here is a reconstructed image of Qumran from uh, Robert Cargill in um, Eucla. At uh, 2009, it's nearly an old picture at this stage. And we go straight to the cemetery. So a description of the cemetery and its excavations. The human remains that are the subject of our study come from the cemetery that extends about 35 meters east of the Qumran settlement. Now that's actually within Jewish religious laws as well. The cemetery has an unusual layout with the main central area and extensions to the north, south and east. It is composed of about 1200 graves 1,200. The main cemetery comprises of tombs of identical neat structure. This aerial view shows the three extending figures at the extreme eastern side of the site and the northern section up at the right. Now, in this old map, which was DeVos, you can see the black dots are, are the French collection, the human remains that rem ended up in the French collection, the stripy dots are the German collection, and some are missing from publications. But as you can see, DeVos was ad hoc in his pickings. It was very randomly chosen. So we have sort of, we have some information, uh, but not an overall estimate of how the health was for the entire population. The location of the tombs initially excavated are also marked on this map. Of the 43 graves excavated by DeVoe, 28 were from the main cemetery. The remainder were from the extensions. They were seven graves in all. 56 graves in total have been opened at Qumran since the 1870s. Accounting for less than 3.2% of the overall population, it's tiny, it's really not enough to make any overall estimate here. The Kerman remains have been examined by several physical anthropologists with significant results. In the beginning, when excavations took place, initially Roland DeVos sent skulls to the museum in Paris and uh, Professor Henri Valois on the 14th of November 1952 replied in a letter he examined tombs 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 15, and 19. He estimated that they were a large-headed population. Four or five are brachycephalic. Now, that's a medical term, but basically it is Greek for flat and short. So the head is flat and short. It is a very different shape to how it would normally be, but it can still be within normal medical range, if that doesn't sound too complicated. Two are mesocephalic, which is normal, and one doliochocephalic, which is a long-faced, long head. That's it, don't worry about the Greek. It's long-faced and short-faced and flat. The extreme wear of teeth was also noted. What these terms mean and how they present at the top of the skull. So as you can see, the diagram on the left is the, the top of the skull as you're looking down and you have different sutures which fuse together at different stages when you're a child and a baby. So on the left is normal, and on the right there are five examples of how these can be abnormal. 
So the top is brachycephalic, which is what we're looking at with a large number of the Cumran population. There's an oxycephalic. There's a, what's here is called scaphocephaly, but it's, it's the long head and the long face as well. And they're the two main ones besides normal that we're seeing with the Cumran population. Does that make sense? Um, is anybody confused about this? No? It's okay? So, and this is a 3D CT scan from University College Dublin, just um, as, as, as an example. These are the different sutures and where they are placed on the skull and they have different stages of closure and normal milestones that should be met. So, if any of these skulls is deformed or out of shape or with deranged from the normal boundaries, we take a look and midwives are trained and young medics are trained to spot this uh, when, when the baby's delivered. So it's what's termed deformation. And in terms of deformation, the surprisingly malleable skull bones of the baby's skull or the baby's head, which means it's quite soft, they're easily manipulated by sometimes cultural trends or indeed gravity. So what we have here, the main cause of the flat short head in babies is simply due to lying in a supine position uh, on their backs with their head on a mattress. Uh, as part of the successful back to sleep campaign, which was brought in the 1990s to prevent the sudden infant death syndrome, and it has been highly successful. So that's one cause for the head shape to be out, uh, out of uh, range and also to be quite flat at the back. A second cause is uh, gravity under the mattress and also a breech position in the womb that can cause a dolly chocephaly, which is long head. I said the, 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 the skull bones develop, in con they're shaped by the mother's womb. And the last one, and this is actually my favorite, uh, because someone famous in the Bible uh, is documented as having this done when they were a baby, and that is swaddling. When a baby is swaddled, it can change the shape of their head and the back of their head as well. So we all know somebody famous who was swaddled as a baby, do we or do we not? So uh, this is another one. This is another cultural example uh, from the, um, the First Nations in America, where uh, I think at one stage they were called the flat-headed tribes by Europeans coming in. So the baby is actually sort of sat or lying on a board and they, they, they want their, the back of their head to become a certain shape. So in various cultures around the world, it was very intentional manipulation of the skull bones to form a specific head shape as has been seen with some ancient and indeed modern tribes, or simply where a child's head is resting on a board for long periods of time. So there's certain degrees of it, and we have on the left in a baby, normal right up to severe. And as I said, medics and midwives are trained to spot this. Again, it can be within normal limits, but also it can be signs that something is wrong. So what we start with is with something called the cephalic index. And uh, Dr. Boileau in the 1950s would have used this to look at his skulls in the Paris uh, Museum. Uh, so really what you do is you divide the head breadth by the head length and multiply by 100 and you get a figure. And that figure shows as it's a long head, it's a flat head, it's normal, it's, it's very, very flat. So he noted, and I'm not going to go through endless lists here, but he noted with the skulls that he did receive from DeVoe that, excuse me, sorry. Six were short and flat skulls and one was very short and flat and it was possibly outside the normal range. So if these shaped heads are not caused by something normal like breech birth in the womb, there might be issues with internal genetic problems. And uh, that needs to be outruled very quickly. It, it's done so nowadays very quickly within a few weeks of, of birth that these signs and symptoms are picked up on, but obviously not 2,000 years ago, uh, although they did have midwives apparently. So craniosynostosis is when the skull bones don't fuse normally. And you've seen the diagrams and there's just more examples up there on the top right and the, the right hand side here. 95% of them are non-genetic. They're non-syndromic. They are absolutely, completely some kind of outside pressure. As I said, the, the mattress, the breech birth. But 95% is, 
is a good figure. Uh, any syndromic ones, any syndromic causes is only 5%. They're very, very rare. Some craniosynostoses, whether primary or secondary, are regarded as more serious than others. So Gottfried Kurt and Roe Ertel, uh, both in 1956, 2000, and 2006, their results of the examination of the skeletons and the heads showed four brachycephalic males, five normal, and two long-headed. Again, I'm not going to go through endless lists because it's just going to bore the pants off everyone, but we're, we're seeing something unusual here. And I'm, I'm only going through all the previous studies that have been done already and stringing the information together. Again, there's the different shapes, heads, normal at the top, and second in from the left is the brachycephalic, and the first in from the left is the dolichocephalic. So you can see the differences in the shapes. So with the German collection, there were nine males, eight females, there were three boys and a seven-year-old girl from the main cemetery. Now, it, these days, it's very difficult to gauge uh, the sex of a prepubescent child uh, in anthropology, but uh, Roe Ertel was an expert in this field, and this was the information that he came up with. Some individuals had only mild levels of tooth abrasion, whilst others, namely Q22, 32, excuse me, 33, had severe levels of abrasion indicating different constituency of foods eaten and diet taken. The individual's concern showed a great difference in age. In total, the German collection contained 16 adults, one seven-year-old, three prepubescent boys, that means they haven't reached puberty yet, and one more child. A skew asymmetrical facial appearance is documented consistently all through the German collection. I just got a, a bit of a Picasso moment there, and I said this might be better to explain what I'm talking about. Especially noted in male Q24 and male Q Q38, both remains examined by Steckel in the 1960s, but part of the German collection. Noted were Inca bones and Wormian bones. An Inca bone at the top is, uh, they're quite harmless, they're sort of within a normal and anatomical range, but Wormian bones can be a sign that there's an issue there are special forms of small fusions of bones noted, like, for instance, the observed Inca bone in Q22 and the many Wormian bones. Tellingly, all are present in the individuals from tombs 21, 22, 33, 36, QSO2, QSO4. These are enough figures for Roe Ertel to query as some of these individuals were sociologically intermarried. And there's a picture of the Wormian bones. It's very, you know, uh, squiggly sort of to look at, but once you sort of see what normal is and then you get to look at what abnormal is. And it was named after a Danish physician. Uh, I don't know, not after a worm or anything like that, or the shape of it. The French collection, Susan Guy Sheridan uh, was an Amer is an American anthropologist who was the last to examine the remains. What she had available to look at is here in the pictures. There's only, uh, I think tomb 18 was more or less the last full skeleton to be available, but we have some sort of bits and pieces of everybody, excuse the expression, to sort of have a, a good look again and see what we could come up with. So the French collection, paleopathology, what she found. There was no cancerous issues. There was fusion of the vertebral bones and there was the Wormian bones. Uh, any metabolic, which is like systemic problems like thyroid, uh, or problems with the teeth showed up, um, and also possible signs of anemia. There was dental problems, obviously, and calculus buildup, and there was degenerative issues like arthritis, which is really not surprising for that time. So she built some common life histories. Q, Q, sorry, tomb four. It was an east-west burial, high carbohydrate diet. She knew that from his teeth. He was an occult spina bifida, and I will explain that a little later on, so just keep that in mind. Tomb 8 had cavities, unusual dental wear, 40 to 45 year old man. They were reasonably young, except for a couple of 60 year olds in there, found in the total collection. Now the next group of studies was in 2003. Aria Shimron conducted chemical analysis on the water of the pools in Qumran. 
in which he found unhealthy, even toxic levels of bromine. Kummerin also showed that there was a high lead problem uh, in the area, especially in locus 49, and arsenic was found in locus 110, 117. So, I mean, if you were like me, you're beginning to wonder how they even lived that long when you see everything that was going against them, stacked against them. So basic, in a nutshell, lead exposure can cause high blood pressure, cognitive dysfunction, which is basically a, a, a medical term for confusion, um, impairment in adults and children, cent issues with cent the central nervous system, kidney problems, and in particular, lead exposure and its effects on enzymes can cause changes in nerve development. So it, it can affect people at a young age and affect their, uh, the, the, the development of this, uh, their central nervous system. Arsenic exposure. We all know this from the Sherlock Holmes films. We know it was arsenic they used. Blah, blah, blah. So arsenic basically can cause skin cancers, lung, bladder, prostate cancer. Leukemia is also thought to be associated with exposure through drinking water. An arsenic load within the human body can cause neurobehavioral disturbances. Basically, we're talking about central nerve, the central nervous system again, the brain and everything associated with it. Neuritis, which is inflammation of the nerves and dysfunction of the sensory peripheral nerves, which is the nerves that are, go to every part of your body. Everybody okay? Anybody, any questions or confused? Okay, the la another set of studies that was done, eight sets of skeletal data, tombs 12, 15, 16, 18, 19, tomb A and tomb B, and in 16, there were two young males. In their paper, Rasmussen et al., preliminary data on trace element concentration in the human bone, it was found that common bone trace elements of zinc, calcium, antimony, cobalt, cesium of these remains were barely two standard deviations away from comparative sites in Bronze Age Denmark and Arabia, so we're fine there. However, strontium and chromium levels were found in very different levels in the three samples, and the Danish sample being the lowest, the Arabian very high, and Kerman actually struck a very happy balance. The bones showed the lowest level of trace elements to the highest from left to right, tomb 12, tomb A, 18, 16B, 16A, tomb 15, and so on. Basically, what the team found with this was that according to the According to their studies, a diet high in basal foods, such as bread, porridge, vegetables, and fruit, but poor in fat and meat, would be represented by high levels of trace elements. The other trace elements found in high amounts in the human bone, in addition to toxic levels found in the plasters of the pool, was bromine. The bromine iodine ratio in the Dead Sea, we're looking at the environment in which these people were buried and in which they lived and in which crops were grown. Can you see where I'm going with this? The bromide iodine ratio in the Dead Sea is higher by 10 to the power of five, exceptionally more than the world's other great salt water body, the Great Salt Lake, who had, which has a, a, a ratio of bromide iodine ratio of six to one. So there's quite a considerable difference. It is also exceptionally low levels of iodine. So we've high bromide and we've very low iodine. Roe Ortel concludes that evidence from soils, bones, and graves indicate that the area and its surrounds, including the graveyard, or cemetery, we say graveyard, and the agricultural area of Einfeschke was supplied by hypersaline bitter aquifer water. The Einfeschke springs, known for their salinity, which have disappeared since antiquity, were three meters higher up, up the slope from the outflow of the current stream. They therefore were not on the same salinity level on the coastal plain. Bromine has an effect on iodine in the thyroid gland, which is here in your neck. Under normal circumstances, it regulates iodine levels. It prevents the excess of the presence of iodine and it, uh, encour it encourages and allows the thyroid to function healthily. If, however, thyroid levels are below range, but bromine levels are high, a goiter can form. And that's the big lump in the front of your throat that you see with probably not so much now, but in olden days problems with the thyroid straight away. Bromine is classed as an agent which inhibits the making of thyroid hormones and secretion, therefore it blocks its transport into the thyroid gland. Is everybody clear with that? 
thyroid hormones have a great effect on craniofacial bone development, especially in pregnant women. Ear bones in the fetus start developing at five weeks and they do not stop growing until 18 weeks. So we're talking about very early in a woman's pregnancy that thyroid hormones can affect facial development. Even minor disruptions to development can have consequences for the structure of the skull. A deficiency causes delayed facial de bone development, tooth development, asymmetrical features, dysplastic they say in medical terms, and delayed development of ear bones. Now keep that in mind because we're going to come back to it later. Hence deafness, and it's a specific type of deafness, it's conductive deafness. The sound waves literally can't get in. It's a different deafness to one caused by measles, which is more of a sensory deafness. All symptoms are associated with the Crumran remains, especially what is reported on the German remains. This is just an example of a, in a modern medical setting, x-rays of a 36-year-old female with severe untreated congenital hypothyroidism. Hypothyroid means your thyroid is, is very slow, it's not working at all. So this was the effect it had on the skeleton. In A, the skull images show persistently open sutures in the head that have infused, and the fontanelles, which is what you call these spaces between the bones in babies, uh, were open and there was delayed tooth development. In X-ray B, limb X-ray shows severe non-fusion of the upper and lower arm bones and very delayed formation of bone growth centers, which are pointed with the arrows. And C, it shows the hand X-ray demonstrating a 35-year delay in bone maturation. So the difference it makes with treatment. Another thing noted in the collections were what is called a metopic suture. Again, it is the frontal bone that hasn't fused properly in this person um, as a child. It was found in TUMS 4, Q20, Q28. So it was failure of the frontal skull bones to close. It is thought to take form as early as seven to eight and nine months of gestation. So that's very, very young. While the, whilst the metopic suture is expected to begin to close by three to nine months, the others close much later in life when the individual reaches their 30s. Metopic suture incidence occurs in only 4%, and it is a triangular appearance when you're looking from the top. It is nearly always associated with hypotellarism, so that is just a big fancy word for the eyes are very close together. In other words, you can see it in the picture here, in the middle picture, compared to normal and abnormal. Metopic suture also can be caused by deformational problems, outside forces. These are a couple of my favorites, actually. Position is a possible cause. Example, the baby's position in the womb or the constraints of the long journey through the birth canal. This can place the cause of metopic suture in the later per periods of pregnancy. As per studies, a, a metopic problem can cause one medical case by, one was caused by deformation in the womb. This particular case shows the baby developing in a bicorruate womb, which is a heart-shaped womb. So he's stuck up there on one side and it's affected the development of his skull bones. And another case was caused by a baby caught between the legs of his triplet siblings. They're all squashed in there. This is what midwives talk about on the coffee breaks. Metopic suture position, oh sorry, excuse me, next slide. So metopic suture, this non-development of the frontal skull bone is also developed, is, is also highly associated with non-development of spatial sinuses, especially here above the eyes. I have just printed off here some examples with some arrows. I know it's very faint and it's difficult to see, but um, the first picture shows normal frontal sinuses here. The next one shows no sinuses have developed. The third x-ray shows they've partially developed and the fourth one shows that they haven't developed on the right side. Now this is something that is very much associated with the, the, the non-closure of the metopic suture. It's the right side and, and these are medical studies right up to 2019, 2020. We're still trying to figure it out why. It's a very complicated process at a cellular level. This is a, a view of a metopic suture. Basically, when you're looking down through the skull in an X-ray, it's a, called a transverse view. 
a coronal view of the skull is on the right side and facial bones and sinuses. The normal sphenoid sinus, sinus is indicated by the yellow asterisk. You can see that in the middle. The non-development of the frontal sinuses associated with the metopic suture are shown by the red asterisk. Now, sinuses, believe it or not, are very important. Apparently, we wouldn't be able to hold our heads up if we didn't have our facial sinuses. They sort of allow for the skull to be lighter. And they've developed in evolutionary terms to be like that, so we can walk upright, basically, or hold our heads up. The non-development of the frontal sinuses associated with the metopic suture are shown by the red asterisk and arrow in the left scan. The metopic suture is indicated by yellow asterisks and yellow arrows in both scans. So you can see that from where you are. So, possible causes of abnormal development and structure of the skull bones. I've given you various examples and they're all found in the Kerman collection. So, we've narrowed it down to a few agents and factors that affect the developing embryo. It could be chromosomal, it could be metabolic disease such as thyroid. And met metabolism means the functioning of your whole body, all systems go. So um, it can be anything in that, in that range. Rickets, which is a lack of vitamin D, and the anemias are a big one. Abnormal brain growth as well, which would be quite unusual. So I'm looking at syndromic and genetic perspectives. This is actually quite, was quite difficult to figure out and to outrule because on the arm of even one chromosome, there can be as many as 120 different syndromes. Some of these syndromes have only been discovered really since the 1960s. So basically my brain was fried trying to do this. I remember meeting someone for coffee and thinking I need to go for a walk here, but we got it down to about seven or eight. So other causes for the flat head, flat short head can be known, can be intrinsic and it's known as malformation in medical, in medical uh, language, thus caused by genes. Failure of the fontanelles to close by 18 months old and an asymmetrical problems of the skeletal system, which is not just the head, but arms, legs, hips, everything, uh, is also cause for consideration. You would, you would start to think seriously about doing genetic testing if, if these signs and symptoms start to display in a baby. So I'm going to fly through these because they're quite uh, complicated, but I'll just name a few. And some I've outruled and some I've actually considered. So syndromic causes are a rate of 5%. They are very, very rare, thankfully, because some of them are really horrible, actually. Now this one, uh, there's also somal dominant, which means you inherit an, an abnormal gene from only one parent. This is a syndrome called Cruzon syndrome, and the skull reveals malalignment of the jaw. You can see it with the white arrow, and only semi-development of the upper jaw. And there are issues of like a beaten copper appearance on the skull. So we haven't seen any of this. The next one is Apert syndrome. It's also autosomal dominant, which means again, abnormal gene from only one parent. As you can see, it's non-fusion of, of the fontanelle in the child. The skull is widely open. There is abnormal closure. There is very, eyes are very close together and flattening downward slanting of the eye sockets. So I have not seen this in any of the bones I've been looking at and neither has anyone else. Another one is Sotra-Chutzen syndrome that needed to be considered before it could be outruled. Also a short, associated with a short flat head and also abnormal fusion of the skull bones. Prominent forehead, mid face arrested development, low set ears and small, um, small ears. So I don't think this is one to be considered either. As I said, I'm just naming them because it was everything we had to plow through. Now, the next one is autosomal recessive, which means you need two copies from each parent. And this would be very, very rare, but in a population that possibly intermarried and a very small population that intermarried, it, it, it had to be considered. So two uh, copies of the abnormal gene must be present in order for the disease or trait to develop. So clockwise from right to left, we have Carpenter and Anthony Bixler. You can see the CT scans, the skulls are abnormal. Um, I have not seen any of this in any of the Kerman remains. Again, it was just something that needed to be considered with the non-closure of, of the sutures of the skull. Another one is opitz trigonocephaly. Now that big word is basically for Greek for triangular appearance, especially when you're looking from the top. And you can see it in the CT scan that the, you know, this is not normal looking. 
syndromic and genetic order disorders. Now, this is where you probably need to sit up and listen a bit and, and wake up because other rare chromosomal disorders are as named. One of them is called Jacobson syndrome. It also is associated with heart defects and also non-development of the ear canal and microsia, which is non malformation and non-development of the outer ear. We have seen this, I have seen this in the Jerusalem remains and it's something we need to consider. The next one is treacher collins syndrome and it's also associated with non-closure of the ear canal, but it is associated with both sides. So we might be able to outrule that. Something else found in tomb four was a called spina bifida, which are a, a basically a, a fancy Greek Latin medical name for when the spinal vertebrae do not close properly. Each vertebrae, each spinal bone is a closed circuit. So when spina bifida occurs, it means that the bone hasn't closed properly and the spinal cord can come out a little bit abnormally. So you can see the four levels. There's a, one of it's only a tuft of hair on the back. The second is the spinal fluid and the spinal cord is sort of bulging. The third and fourth are much worse versions. Basically, what we can say about it is that in tomb four, who was found to have an occult spina bifida, that in medical studies in the 1990s, defects such as this, such as this were reduced by as much as 70%, which is huge. 70% when folic acid was introduced into the woman's uh, pregnancy in the early weeks. So this would indicate we can backtrack here and we can sort of um, figure out that it is a high probability that tomb four's mother, when she was in the early stages of her pregnancy, lacked folic acid in her diet when she was pregnant. Does that make sense? Okay. In the German collection, we have dental aplasia or non-formation of many teeth. And you can see it here. You can see the x-ray and you can see that it's, it's not normal. There's, there's something wrong here. I'm just gathering up all the information and reveal everything at the end, like a good magic trick, I hope. So we have a 3D picture of the skull. We have the temporal bone, which holds the ear opening and the ear canal. Everybody can see that? You're happy enough that that's... Okay, and this is the temporal bone, and that's the ear hole there, right in the middle. The opening to the ear and the canal within. Brief, a very brief anatomy and physiology of the ear. Internally, we have the middle ear and we have these tiny little bones called the hammer, the anvil and the stapes, which is, um, they conduct sound to the nerve and onto the brain. The eustachian tube, sorry, I better point a bit here, which is here, is a canal that links to the back of the nose and it helps to equalize the pressure in the middle ear. This is needed for the proper transfer of sound waves. There are three small bit bones, as I mentioned, called the malleus, incus, and stapes, which is just the Latin for the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. That's, they are there, they conduct sound, and they're tiny, tiny, tiny bones, but we would not be able to hear without them. Now, picture below, the snail shape is the cochlea. Okay, you can figure it out from the Latin. And this contains the nerves for hearing. And then the vestibule and semicircular canals, this one here, these are got to do with balance. If you end up car sick or afraid of heights or vomit or what, you know, it's all got to do with this. This is your balance in the body along with your big toe, believe it or not. Now, what we did find and what has been found in Qumran is what's called auditory exostosis. Again, a big fancy name for, it is a bony growth in the ear canal. It's also known as surfer's ear. It's like the ear's way of protecting itself, protecting its delicate inner, inner self from sort of rough environment like cold water and wind. If the pathology is due to constant submersion in water, it is usually both sides. It is nearly always both sides. It cannot be otherwise unless somebody is sticking their head in the water like this for years on end. So on x-ray, on CT scan, view of the condition, bilateral, which means both sides, shows external auditory exostosis or surfer's ear as it's nicknamed. Yellow arrows point to both. It is nearly always both sides. This is looking down through the skull and the nasal bones are on the top of the picture. So you can see 
here and here, there's sort of bony outgrowth tear. This is your ear canal, and usually it's a nice normal S shape. It appears black on an X-ray. So something's wrong here, but it, it, it's both sides. Other causes of this, there's a few different differential diagnoses, as we say, which means other causes, other possible causes. One is an osteoma, which is a benign non-cancerous tumor of the bone. This is nearly always one-sided. It is a single stalk-like bony overgrowth. Okay, it, it's pedunculated, which is, again, sorry, it's a big fancy word. I'll show you a picture now in a second. And they're usually found at the ear bone cartilage area. These, you, these lesions may be associated with earwax, debris, and a secondary cholesteatoma, all right? Don't worry, I'll explain. So a CT scan, one is looking down through the head and one is looking straight through the head, shows the stalk-like bony growth. You can see it there and here. It's nearly blocking the whole canal. Um, it's arising in the frontal wall. It is almost obliterating the canal and the sagittal view is looking straight at it on the right-hand side. Secondary, another um, issue, what, what's called the cholestia, cholesteatoma, is an abnormal collection of skin cells. It is cyst-like and usually consists of flakes of bone and earwax. I hope nobody's just had their dinner. In the living, they, in the living they usually occur as a result of chronic middle ear infections and present as tearing or bursting of the tympanic membrane. And symptoms are ear pain, leakage of, and leakage of fluid from the ear. They are 98% acquired, which means they're not necessarily inherited, they're very unlikely inherited. They're just something that's acquired um, down through, through someone's life. With the tympanic membrane and the eustachian tube, which regulates air and pressure. They can also extend into the middle ear, affecting the facial nerves. So your middle ear goes quite deep in here and is much closer to the brain than you, than you might think. So it, it would definitely affect your, your main say, facial nerves here. Sorry, I have another picture here coming up. Excuse me, sorry, this one always gets stuck. Oh. Okay, that's just another diagram of the year, just to kind of keep you up to date. So you can see there's your middle, there's your ear canal, there's your outer ear and there's your nerves and your snail shell there. So another CT scan shows a right-sided, one-sided unilateral external canal cholesteatoma. That's on the left. So you can see, look, that's your ear canal. Nice s shape there, completely blocked there. And this is a normal ear canal. You can see that's what it should look like. So there is another special type of secondary cholesteatoma of the external auditory canal. And we have found these with Cumran. And these were found in the burials in tomb 16A, 16B, tomb 19, and possibly tomb A, and they're here in the Jerusalem collection. Some are one-sided and very distinct. Others are found on both sides with only minimal or partial development. Now I'm just talking in general about what you look for, but we, we don't have enough of the remains to, to figure out whether it's, it's both sides in all of them. They can be caused by several different reasons. They can be inherited or it can be an environmental factors that affect it. Okay. Tomb 16, age 30 to 40 year old male. This is his left temporal bone. Um, his auditor meatus, basically his ear opening is, it hasn't formed. It is an undeveloped ear canal opening known as atresia or congenital auditory meatus aplasia. I'm sorry about this. I should have written it in plain English. So left and right side, he has both. His left side is worse than his right. And also he had wormy and bones. Remember the squiggly bones we were talking about? This is an inferior view of 16A from uh, on the right side. This is where the issue is and this is it's just a bit bulky looking and an asymmetrical in appearance. There could be issues going on inside as well, which we're hoping to further investigate. 16B, another tomb, 30 to 40 year old robust male, 
discovered buried with tomb 16A, left temporal bone with absence of the ear hole and the ear canal again. However, on the right side, it has the appearance of a normal open external auditory meatus. So the first gentleman in 16A would have been deaf. He, he's, he, he would not have been able to conduct sound waves because his ears weren't open, and this guy would have been partially deaf. I'll show you a better picture here, and I'll point to just exactly what we're dealing with here. So I have, that is what's called the mastoid process. That is the big lumpy thing behind your ear here, and the ear hole is very near to that. So this is what we're looking at here. There's the ear opening to the ear, and that's the left mastoid process. Everybody okay with that? Tomb 19, very high cranial index, very, very flat short head. Right-sided view of the skull. Um, his ear hole has developed, but it's very, very small. It's not normal. And we had a lot of preservation vaccine in situ, which I didn't want to go picking at because I was afraid I'd break something. That's a closer look here. Right-sided interior view of the skull. I was trying to see if the, I could see the canal from the inside as opposed to going out, and I think it's this little bit here, but it's blocked from the outside. And again, this is where this man's ear opening and ear canal is meant to be. It's not opened at all. That's the left temporal bone, and this is two May. This was just, I went back to check things and I found another one, which is two May. Um, so we, we think this, I think there's something going on here with this lady as well. She's a female. So we're getting near the end. A CT scan example. It's a modern day um, example just to show you. It is a four-year-old little girl who presented with hearing loss uh, and did not benefit from hearing aids. And her examination showed profound hearing loss. A CT of the head showed her temporal bone where her ear canal is. There was absolute, complete non-development of the ear canal, which is the white arrow here. Okay, so you can see there's no opening there at all. And then her tiny inner ear bones were dysplastic, which means malformed, abnormal. They were useless. She couldn't hear anything. But the good news is they did a cochlear implant and she's, she's well again. Now, whatever about abnormal ear bones on the inside, this is how it can appear on the outside. They're, the two nearly go hand in hand, and it's all during possible developmental phases in the early pregnancy of the mother. So that's one consideration. The next big one is the anemias. And we have inherited and acquired anemias. Thalassemia is gene mutations. There are different levels of it. There's, there's bad, worse, and the worst, basically and it depends on the number of uh, gene mutations that you inherit from your parents. For example, one mutated gene, you'll have no signs of thalassemia, but you are a carrier of the disease. Two muta mutated genes, your thalassemia signs and symptoms will be mild. And three mutated genes, it'll be moderate to severe. That's just from the Mayo Clinic in the States. Now, a little piece of French this is from the uh, forensic um, anthropologist that I'm working with in Paris, and he has a list of signs to look for in skeletal data that might indicate thalassemia and inherited anemia. And we have four or five uh, symptoms in the um, Cumran remains. So you can read in French, I've pointed it out with a red arrow, but I'm going to say it in English because I, 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 I can't even think to speak in French at the moment. So... Uh, uh, a voluminous head, a saddled nose, which is very pronounced, or a ski slope nose, as they call it, absence of uh, the pneumonization of the sinus, uh, maxillary sinus, which is the sinus, sinuses in the head and front of the face have not developed. There is a, a prominent upper uh, overbite. We've seen that as well. And we have anomalies of dentition, which means the teeth haven't developed yet. So we're, we've, we've just seen all the signs and symptoms here. And the other one is hypertellurism, which is the eyes are very close together. So we could have people with um, inherited anemias here as well. 
This, if you're very stuck and no DNA, this a radiograph or an X-ray in someone with thalassemia will show a hair on end appearance, as you can see with the X-ray. It's like a, a brush appearance of the bone. Can you see that? The next one is sickle cell anemia. I was wondering about this for the children, just by the fact that they didn't, none of them saw 10 years of age. And this disease is quite serious. It's still serious. And, you know, a lot of specialist treatment is required these days. But 2,000 years ago, they wouldn't have had a hope of surviving. However, they have not showed any skeletal symptoms of sickle cell anemia. So perhaps that wasn't the cause of their early demise. Sickle cell is an inherited sickle cell disease unique to red blood cells. A person, a gene carrier, can have sickle cell trait. Um, nowadays, it is very much associated with people of Mediterranean and African descent. Millions and millions of years ago, when malaria was dominant in the, on the planet, it was actually the body's way of defending itself against malaria. The blood, red blood cells would double over in the shape of a sickle to prevent infection, and it, it became embedded in the DNA. So a sign of this on an x-ray or on a skull is striping of the bone. I show you an old x-ray here, excuse me, which is there. Lamin it's called lamination. So if we've no DNA and we're trying to figure out if this is a genetic disease, we can x-ray and it should show this. Another type of anemia called megaloblastic anemia is generally caused by a lack of B12 and folic acid. Very, very common. And these are the foods that are rich in B12 and folic acid. So obviously the people at Kerman did not eat, or maybe they did, food like this. But again, uh, you know, red meat, green vegetables, we think uh, they, they lacked that in their formative years. We're nearly the end now. So two, four, five, and several of the children in uh, the German collection, many have signs of anemia, but which type? Tomb four and tomb five meet several criteria. Inherited anemias, uh, or it could be dietary caused. Sickle cell anemia was a possibility for the children, but they really have no skeletal signs or it's not documented by the German anthropologist and he's very good. If it was there, he would have seen it. So that's exposed frontal bones. There can also be a lack of vitamin C associated with lack of B12 and folic acid. So we're talking about diet again. And we're talking about lines on the teeth as well is also evident in abundance. And this, these lines on the teeth called hypoplasia means that there's been dreadful disruptions to the growth of a child, which means that there was severe illness or there was severe lack of diet or proper diet. One last thing, skin, teeth, nails and bones. This is seen throughout the German collection and it can be associated with inherited issues known as ectodermal dysplasias. Basically, what we're talking about is very early in the pregnancy again. The fetus develops from one germ cell which breaks up into three different directions. One develops into teeth, one develops into bone. If there's any kind of interruption of this, there will be problems. It can be associated with or similar to the cause of non-development of the ear canal and its opening. Clinical science can present in as many as 120 syndromes, and that's breaking it down. It can also be caused by infection and pharmaceutical influences. We have a lot of sinus, ears, and possible metopic sutures in the German collection. We have a lot of problems with development of bones and teeth. I can't say anything about skin and hair, but we can guess. So I just have the, the number of people documented here ear infection, possibly middle ear infection, non-formation of teeth it comes up again and again in the German collection. Um, sinusitis, problems with the sinus, non-fusion of the frontal bones. So we have possible syndromes narrowed down to a few. The, the, the biggest one I think could be Treacher-Collins syndrome, which is very, very, very uh, asymmetrical facial development, but it has to, the, the ear canal non-development is both sides, so we might be able to outrule that. The next one is number five, 18 Q syndrome non-develop of the ear canal. Jacobson syndrome is non-development of the ear canal, and Cruzon syndrome and Apert's I have outruled. 
I don't think they're possible here, but we, we do have a couple of big possibilities. If it's not syndromic, other considerations are the inherited anemias, such as thalassemia of the alpha and beta type, the severe type, sickle cell anemia, inherited anemia, and dietary anemia. Now, the, another big one, which I think is valid and I think is worth further investigation, is the high bromide levels in the bones and in the surrounding environment could be a factor. And I think thyroid in the mother could have been an issue as well. So it's down to sort of three main points here. High bromide levels can also indicate a marine diet. So if you're eating fish for your diet and those fish are swimming in water, which is highly saline and very bromide rich, the fish, the fish are gonna be high in bromide as well. Okay, I'm finishing up now. I hear someone sighing over there. So suggestions. Excuse me. Well, so you have no DNA samples and, and the last anthropologist tried, she tried everything. She did absolutely her level best and could not extract any information from the bones because they were too deteriorated. But a CT scan would highlight more serious issues with anemias. These are just suggestions for further studies. Uh, four skulls in the Jerusalem collection show signs of congenital non-development non of ear openings and canals. Five, in the absence of DNA instruction to outrule possible genetic causes, we could just do sort of a logical examination of the Alcazoni remains uh, which are, who are, were found on the other side of the Dead Sea to see if they have problems with their ears. We could make a, a guesstimate or an estimate that they possibly uh, could be an environmental factor that has affected people. Shimron's studies of arsenic and lead influence definitely would have influenced the health picture and needs to be gone, go, gone into more detail. Chemical analysis of the water in Vinefeshka Spring and analysis of the soils and sands, we need to get bromide levels there. Coring or auguring samples of the soils and sands for that time period may highlight soil chemistry in which crops were grown and in which food was eaten and ended up in the diet of the people there. Lumber sacralization, which is basically your base of your spine is fused together. They're not separate bones as they should be. It was found in tomb three, but it was also found across the Dead Sea in Alcazone, and this may be a sign of interrelatedness. And that's it. And thank you for listening. <laughs>